And um, so he received the traditional education in Tibet. And what is that? That is something that uh, is due to the kindness of Shakyamuni Buddha, who got enlightened right here within two kilometers of where I sit. And um, the Indian pundits and the great Indian masters. And then later you see the great uh, Nalanda University kept the tradition alive. Uh, so that tradition died out in India, as you know, but before it died out, it had been transmitted to Tibet through the incredible hardship, uh, hard work of Tibetan and Indian translators and sundry, uh, you know, monastics, non-monastics, teachers, so forth. Uh, also due to the kindness sponsorship of very enlightened Tibetan kings who realized the importance of the teachings, uh, who were very special people by all, by all accounts and whose teachings we've adopted actually in our school here in Bodhgaya, something called the 16 guidelines for a happy life that's um, adapted from the edicts and the uh, advice of one of the Tibetan kings, Swangsen Gampo. So anyway, my point is that uh, the Indian, the Tibetans, or educated Tibetans who practice, study the Dharma, they realize their debt to India, you see, and to Indian master. And uh, of course, we have a great debt now towards the Tibetans for keeping the tradition alive so wonderfully for uh, a thousand years and more since the time it died out in India. And due to the kindness of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who uh, came back, who escaped to India, as you know, in 1959. And a tremendous hardship they went through when they came to India, not only to reestablish normal life, but to keep the teachings alive. Uh, the studies and teachings went on in very difficult conditions. Uh, many died. Many monks and nuns died uh, of TB, especially uh, new climate, different food. Everything was different from Tibet, but they kept it alive. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because you see, this is something that the Tibetans kept very close to their heart, the dharma, and uh, it was due, as they said, to the holy land of India, which is where it all came from. So Lama Yeshe up here, he recognized that. So not only was there the kindness of the Indian people in uh, being the, you could say, the, the source of the Dharma, 2,600 something years ago, but also they gave refuge unstintingly, Nehru and others, unstintingly gave refuge to the Tibetans, whatever may be criticisms later, Nehru uh, not being tough enough on the Chinese, but he gave total, you know, almost a blank. Yeah, anyway, helped His Holiness the Dalai Lama so much. They were offered land in North and South India, as well as different other places <laughs> to establish the great monasteries. Um, so all of that kindness, you see. So it's been spanning, well, since the 8th century, you see, the Tibetans would say since the 8th century, they are living on the kindness of the, of the Indian, historic Indian people, as Lama Yeshe put it. So Lama wanted to repay that kindness in whatever way he could. And of course, his main work just happened to be with Westerners, because that's what was happening in those days. Westerners were coming from abroad, overland to India, imagine overland all the way with no major difficulties, a welcome in all of those countries where there is now conflict, of course, and great danger. Um, so they are the ones who were the first recipients of Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa Rinpoche's kindness in giving the teachings. But of course, people like Lama Yeshe would never forget the initial debt to India. And he really wanted in this center in Bodhgaya to uh, help uh, Indian people a great deal with not only what we started with, which was social programs and which we are still continuing in the form of a school and a clinic mainly, 
but also of course with the uh, teachings Arma teachings something that helps long term <coughs> excuse me so yeah that's a bit of a potted quick history of where I'm talking from which is a two and three quarter acre plot uh, about uh, one and a half kilometer walk from the main temple Mahabodhi temple where the famous uh, well where the descendant of the uh, original Bodhi tree is, people tree, under which Lord Buddha sat. Uh, and where there's a very, very, I would say, very powerful uh, place for practice. And uh, yeah, spiritual practice, very wonderful place. The main temple of Bodhgaya. Uh, and so, yeah, I really do pray and hope that uh, many of you can, all of you can go there one day. It is very special, very special. Uh, especially if you know, you've taken refuge, or if you're a Buddhist, then um, it's very good to go, very good to come here. Although there can be hardships <laughs> and uh, crowds, big crowds in the winter and uh, big heat in the summer. But, uh, you know, wherever we are, there's some. We have almost half of price now, people can come off season. Oxygen, if somebody wants to come here, we have a price cut of half. Oh, so now we're getting ad, 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 advertising space for uh, Root Institute. Uh, um, we have uh, Rajesh Ji is sitting here with me. Can you see him? Say hello, hello Rajesh everybody. Ji. Hello. So Rajesh Ji is working for us here at Root Institute. And he's saying that half price during the summer. When does half price start? Off season, like after March. Oh, so now, after March, we're after March already, up have, to uh, September, maybe. I have offered my life. Yeah, no, anyway. Which is what it Good, good. So he has offered his life to help this work. So you can come and offer your time and money and enjoy both gal. So we'll expect to see some of you here. Yeah, or well, especially you three musketeers who are sitting there in uh, upstairs in uh, in Tushita. I think we have Bob and Vivek Ji and this very lovely young man whose name I always forget. So sad. Anyway, thank you for being there. Uh, yeah, you look very wonderful together. Yeah. Okay. And thank you to everybody else. Sagar Bhai is there. Bhavya, we, I don't know, I think. Uh, Prajanya Ji, uh, Pradeep. Sabashir, Tia's there, lovely, Tibbs, Abhishek ji, wonderful, Shivastav ji, Shreya, Ajir ji is there from Australia, he's in Melbourne right now, Neil, Kuheli Banerjee, lovely, OnePlus DN2101, what a name, iPhone, Samsung SM, and another Samsung SM, that seems to be the brand, and Alexandra McDonald, so wonderful, uh, I'm really grateful to all of you. And uh, again, apologize for, uh, and Neerajji, I think I forgot to say her name, Neeraj Bhai Namaskar. <laughs> uh, everybody, welcome. So we've been, uh, let's start without saying too much more. We will have some motivation, some motivation. Some days it's easier to motivate, isn't it? You feel inspired, you feel touched by something you saw or felt. And there are days when one doesn't feel somehow so self-preoccupied when we get up in the morning. And sometimes, you know, there are days when you only, where one is only thinking of you know, one's own matters, if you know, this and that pertaining to me and my life. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, but it's just sometimes it's just so much of me, me, me and my agenda, and my program, my problem what I want, what I don't want. But then there are days when you see something or hear something, or you remember something, or you read something, you see? You read something. Now, not necessarily in a dharma book. It could be anywhere. It could be in a newspaper. It could be in great literature, which often has the power, doesn't it, to move us, you know, because great authors have great insights. They have great empathy, compassion very often. So whatever it is, um, try to, uh, 
You see, we're all part of a human community, which includes animals. We had a picnic up at there on the mountain, halfway up the mountain this morning. Uh, Rajeshi's wife had very kindly made parathas, and we had dahi and laddus, and we had a great time. So there, you know, one uh, female uh, dog came, one bitch came over, and, uh, you know, Rajeshi was feeding her. She gladly had something and went away. Then the male dog came, and he also had some paratha, lucky fellow. Uh, luckily, all the langurs, there are a lot of langur monkeys, they didn't come. That would have been havoc. They stayed by the main road going up to the temple where most people walk up. We had come up and gone to the side in a slightly isolated spot for the picnic. And, you know, you thought of these dogs and somehow, yeah, one can think at those moments of how precious it is to be human, you know, and to be able to uh, enjoy and create positive energy in a holy place like that. Mahakala mountain. Whereas the dog, the dogs, um, they can't do that. They can just uh, scrounge for food. And the bitch can just have puppies and, uh, you know, spend her life doing that. And wasn't well fed, wasn't well fed. Uh, male dogs slightly better, but not much better. So just that, you know, helps one be grateful for being human, right? And somehow thinking that how wonderful it would be if one could be less distracted in one's life and uh, meaning more focused on the path of virtue, to use an old, old fashioned term. Uh, virtue, not used very much now, probably a bit of an ugly word to a lot of modern people, I don't know. But that which, you know, has the power to create lasting happiness and even liberation, you see, that kind of energy can be created by remembering, uh, being grateful for being human. And then the rickshaw wala who brought us back, it, you see, it, it's obvious how important the money was for, for that young boy, a young man. <clears throat> from close to the Bodhya area. Um, it's very important. And uh, here's a young man who has the potential of, you know, like we do, we think we do anyway, to become awakened. And uh, so anyway, he's spending most of his life, I guess, uh, driving a, a three-wheeler and being rather concerned about the money that he earns, which is obvious, you know, excuse me, which is quite natural. I don't know how much time he has for other pursuits which might be pertaining to waking up, liberation. So anyway, there are many things one can see, especially if one has done a little bit of study, which is why study is so important. Because if one studied a little bit and begun to understand a little bit, one realizes how this um, cyclic existence or samsara that we are caught up in, how painful it really is and how the source of it is hard to understand, hard to discover. And when one's discovered what the source is, which is the self-grasping ignorance, then of course, it's not easy to uproot it. And one can be quite clever about understanding it, but to actually engage in the path of uprooting that um, self-grasping, me, me, me attitude, that is not easy, is it? So uh, anyway, what is that sound? This is, oh, already, already, already back up, pulling the battery. Oh, has the power gone? Power is there. Power is there. Okay. okay. Um, so let's spend some time. I don't need to especially tell uh, the old students uh, how to motivate. Uh, just think of something for a few minutes that helps you bring your mind towards uh, 
the teachings of the Buddha, the Holy Dharma, um, which helps us uh, not, at least for an hour or so, not worry so much about pleasure and pain, gain and loss, good reputation, bad reputation, praise and blame, all those things. Let's not worry about them for a little while. And let's see if we can turn our mind towards, um, towards virtue, towards goodness, towards manifesting the uh, openness, the clarity, the warmth, intelligence that we, uh, that we all have. Okay, so please just spend a little time generating that in your own way. Okay, we'll spend three, two or three minutes on that. <clears throat> yeah. 
one other way, I mean, there are infinite ways to reflect, you know, obviously, based on your, one's own experience and the, um, you know, how old one is, how much one has studied, so many things. But one thing that's useful is to, for me, is to think how sometimes I can get quite annoyed when I feel somebody may be cheating me, say, charging me 50 or 100 rupees more than something should be. And of course, that for me isn't a big deal right now. I can afford to be cheated that much, but it's kind of a big deal sometimes. One gets a little worked up. But then think of, I try and think of how in a much larger sense, I'm cheating myself. I'm cheating myself by not taking the essence of this human life. Well, what is the essence of a human life? Well, we've spoken about it so many times. I mean, on a relative level, it's, you know, to be a very kind and relaxed and open, wise, firm, whatever person, you know, functional in all sorts of ways and is able to um, offer uh, not only to oneself, nourish oneself and the close ones, family maybe or something, but also to be able to offer something to society. And then on the ultimate level or deeper level also to be able to uh, discover, uncover one's uh, inner potential, inner potential, you know, and work with that, which is of course, um, unknown territory to many of us. Um, I read something amazing by Amitabh Ghosh, yeah? the author Amitabh Ghosh, I got the name right. He said that he was drawn to reading as a youngster as a refuge from a world that seemed to be at war with the idea of an inner life. That's quite a remarkable phrase. He was drawn to reading a lot as a young person, as a refuge from a world that seemed to be at war with the idea of an inner life. Matla, we don't pay much attention to the inner life. The inner life is actually something pretty disastrous or uh, ir you know, irritating because it bubbles up in the form of emotions and moods, uh, you know, strong emotions, moods, feelings, uh, and so forth. And we haven't come to terms with them. And as for what we can do inwardly, we have neglected that. You know, we have neglected the inner work and focused um, on the outside, haven't we? And become very clever and successful at that in many ways. Although, you know, look at the world right now, an alien from wherever might think we're totally, we're really stupid, self-destructive species. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so one can motivate also by thinking you know, how much longer am I going to cheat myself of my heritage, of my inheritance, which includes this, the, uh, the, uh, the inner world of the mind? What do I know about my mind? I might be so clever at uh, economics, finances, current affairs, technology, etc. A very, very good, you know, conversationalist, whatever. But what do I know about my inner feelings? How do I cope when I feel sad or upset or angry? And what do I know about deeper strata of my mind, which can be activated, it is said, through meditative uh, practice, through contemplative practice? What do I know about that? If I don't know anything, then, or hardly anything, then aren't I cheating myself?
And you see, death is definite. <laughs> we don't know when this opportunity is going to come to an end. This opportunity to sit in on Zoom sessions and so on and so forth. We don't know how long it will last. We don't have to die either. We can sustain an injury, which makes it impossible for us to participate, understand anything that's happening. Not to be in such great pain that we cannot focus. But right now we're okay. So how wonderful that is. These are always worth thinking about, I think. One good thing about coming to a place like Bodh Gaya, as a pilgrim, I mean, not as someone who has work to do here necessarily, but as a pilgrim, is one can slow down and begin to pay attention to the, to the inner life, just like Lord Buddha did. Spending six years ascetic retreat, and of course he'd done a lot before that. And countless lives he'd been practicing apparently in various ways. But anyway, Bodhga is a place where one can do that. And of course for many holy places of different religions around the world, one can do that. That's important. So then there's the kindness of others we've been talking about. So there's the kindness we spoke about at length of the mother, which is extraordinary, and the father, and those who take care of us. And <clears throat> unless we are really extremely selfish and self-centered people, uh, we can realize every day how much we depend on others. Even though we may be someone who had to do a lot ourselves, you know? Sometimes when we've had to do a lot ourselves, like maybe a parent died or had some problem, so we had to act as a parent to our younger, you know, no, siblings, or had to do a lot of work, let's say, from a young age, then we can grow up thinking that I'm owed a lot by others. You know? I've done so much for others. And of course, to some extent, this makes sense. But still, every day of one's life, one is dependent on others. We are always receiving so much from others, always, depending on the kindness of others. For the electricity right now, without which this session wouldn't happen, the Wi-Fi, everything. Even though I can tell you, for years we've been complaining about the Bihar State Electricity Board and all of their bills, but still, they're providing something we're all benefiting from. The roads, everything. I mean, the roads we complain about. So there's always something, whether we think we were self-made or had to make a lot of sacrifices when we were young, which we may have had to, but still, the kindness of others is unbelievable. Really, it's extraordinary. When one thinks about it, when one doesn't think about it, then one takes it for granted. Then it's just like natural. Oh, you know, I invited, they decided Rajesh Ji and his family to come. The next thing I know, his wife has prepared this sumptuous breakfast, you know, by getting up early, even though she couldn't sleep much due to the heat and mosquitoes last night. But she made this incredible nashta for all of us. amazing. They paid for a lot of the expenses. So, you know, the kindness of others is uh, extraordinary, actually. And then even if one has been hard done by, and some of us have been, maybe, mistreated by others, literally, cheated by others, by all sorts of people, even people close to us, maybe. But even then, through the dharma, there's a way to transform that pain into something which is a bit more meaningful and to see how it helps us to become even more, even more mature, even more 
courageous and compassionate inwardly, <clears throat> which is where it matters, inwardly, not the outward show, right? So we've spoken a lot about the kindness of others. Now, how might we help others in return? Repaying the kindness never had a good ring to me, but I've used that. Repaying the kindness is the ones repaying a debt or something financial. So anyway, it's just language. It's words. Remember the words are supposed to take us beyond the meaning, beyond the words to the meaning and to the deeper meaning and to attend to that deeper meaning with our wisdom awareness, with a wise part of our minds, if you like not a distracted, superficial, gup shops kind of mind. You know? <clears throat> mm. So then, how do we, how could we help others in return? How do we help others right now? Is it, more sort of transactional. You help me, I help you. That makes sense. But what else could we, how else could we approach this? Let's approach it, and there are many ways to do this, uh, in the sense of what we might offer or give to others, okay? Uh, traditionally, and there's different ways that different schools of Tibetan Buddhism have slightly different ways of putting this, and it would be put maybe there would be many, many different ways of looking at it according to the Pali tradition, the Pali canon of teachings. But let's look at it in the sense that, in the way that I've been taught a little um, in the teachings on giving in the uh, Mahayana teachings on giving, for example, uh, there are different categories, aren't there? So one way is to divide it into four things, four ways of giving to others, helping others through giving, which is the first perfection also of the Bodhisattva is uh, giving. Um, even before ethical conduct, there's giving. Um, Dhāvana Paramita. So we can give material, material things of any kind, food, clothing, housing, medicine, all those kind of things are material giving. Um, okay, that's one. Then there is um, giving of what is called uh, freedom from fear. That could, of course, involve many things. But it's kind of being a sort of a helper and a guide and somebody who is um, giving, for example, good advice uh, to someone who is uh, having certain problems or fears, you know, things like that. Uh, even giving them, traditionally, that would also be, also be the giving of uh, refuge or shelter for people who are, say, traveling in certain circumstances and need, uh, you know, sh shelter, especially in difficult circumstances, that kind of thing, all, all those sorts of things, uh, freedom, giving freedom from uh, fear, freedom from difficult situations. Then there's the giving of loving kindness, the giving of love. That's a vast thing as well. That's a vast area. And you see how they overlap, obviously. It's just different ways of approaching giving. What might the giving of loving kindness be? Well, we can look, we can look at that. And then the fourth is the uh, giving of dharma. And as we know, there is this uh, expression, and my Sanskrit is not good, but there's this expression, uh, there's this Sanskrit phrase, isn't there, that uh, the, the gift of dharma uh, is greater than all gifts. The gift of dharma is, is the greatest gift. I suppose because if we can really 
really appreciate the Dharma and begin to practice it and allow it to transform our lives, then there's no greater gift than that. That helps us in this life and it helps us in future lives, which is the purpose of true Dharma. As you know, some of you, it is not considered to be Dharma if something only helps us in this life. It's not considered to be Dharma and not a Dharma attitude if we are only aiming at happiness in this life. Tradition. So long-term aim, long-term happiness, liberation, enlightenment, helping others with the teachings that lead to that. That would be the highest form of giving. And there's no better way to repay others' kindness than to do that. And if you look at Buddha's life, of course, he's criticized a lot by certain traditional people who have not studied enough his life. They criticize him, obviously, for leaving his wife and young son to adopt the ascetic life. Uh, I remember one of my family members was actually quite angry talking about it, how Buddha left his family. She was more into Ram and Krishna and so forth. She was heavily... Uh, very critical of Lord Buddha, you know. Anyway, so <clears throat> if we look at the Buddha's life, he came back later, you see. He came back, gave teachings to his son, to his wife, although she was initially a bit gruff with him, so forth. Uh, Rahul, his son, even became an arhat which is a very high level of attainment, liberation from samsara, uh, through the teachings and the inspiration that the Buddha gave his son. Um, he also, it is said, had this ability to visit and teach his mother, who had been reborn in, in, a, in a very pleasant place, in, in a kind of heavenly realm, Tushita. Uh, he was able to teach her that help her. He never forgot the kindness of his mother. And she had died when uh, he was very young. Um, <clears throat> he taught her. And actually the place where it said he then put, you know, came back to earth, if you like, Sankisa, is now, uh, the, you could say, the westernmost uh, traditional holy place of the uh, eight places of Buddhist pilgrimage. Sankisa, not far from Rukabad and Manpuri in um, pretty much a Western UP. That is uh, where he descended from heaven after teaching his mother. <clears throat> Again, an interesting place to visit, not yet spoiled by tourism so much. So, you know, the Buddha repaid the kindness by giving the ultimate gift of the Dharma. Because his, you know, his wife, his son, they had everything they needed physically. They didn't, it's not as though when he left them, they didn't have enough to eat. They were prosperous people, you know, they were. But he gave them something that helped them long term. For example, what did the Buddha, and I'm at random talking about this. Yeah, we're starting with the Dharma. Maybe we, we, we should have started with material objects. But anyway, we're starting with the giving of Dharma. How did the Buddha help you know, criminals or people who would be regarded as criminal in this life? You know, who are, you know, under the law. There's Angulima. Now, whether or not it's true that he had a mala of 999 thumbs or fingers, whatever, that's not the point, but the point is that he was a violent person who had killed people and had a kind of talismans from each of them, like the old days of the Wild West, people would scalp somebody and keep the dried scalp as a trophy. So anyway, Angulimal had uh, apparently all these um, thumbs in a mala. And who knows, there could have been some kind of guru who told him that it's a good thing to do, he should try and get even more. So there he was trying to get his thousandth thumb 
unguli, unguli, unguli mala, a mala of thumbs. And there he had the good for the bad, for the good fortune, of course, to see the Buddha in the forest. Right? He saw the Buddha in the forest. He starts running after the Buddha to kill him. And he can't reach the Buddha. The Buddha seems to be very majestically, calmly strolling through the forest. And Angulimal can't reach him. Very interesting. Then Buddha says to, uh, you know, Angulimal says to the Buddha, stop, stop. You know, he's getting tired. You know, he can't catch the Buddha. I don't think he knows who the Buddha is. The Buddha turns around and says absolutely fearlessly to him, obviously, absolutely no fear. I have stopped. Angulimal, I have stopped. You have not stopped. Meaning, I've stopped engaging in non-virtue long ago, but you haven't. You're still running around in circles. And because of the absolute, you could say, fearlessness of the Buddha, who of course, remember, had uh, totally overcome self-grasping ignorance, so had no ordinary grasping at any kind of sense of self or me, or I'm the Buddha, or anything like that. And because not only that, but he was totally in an unimaginable way for us infused with loving kindness, the embodiment of love, such as Angulimal might have never ever experienced in his whole life, even from his own mother, or maybe he had from his mother some sort of love, but it's doubtful if he had a good upbringing, isn't it? If he got involved with somebody telling him to get a thousand thumbs, his trophies. So anyway, this is the first time in Angulimal's life, no doubt, that he could feel unconditional love coming from anybody. And we're just using a word here, love. But the actual feeling, sensation, uh, Angulimal felt, you know, hard to gauge and very hard to know exactly what the love of a Buddha is. It is just something unimaginable, I suppose, because it is not caught up in any kind of uh, labeling or grasping. Yeah. So that is there. And Angulimal, what happened to Angulimal? He he melted, in a sense. He melted in front of the Buddha. He, there he is, down on his knees, probably weeping. Uh, you know, asking for forgiveness and um, asking to, uh, you know, be given instructions, which he is. And he also becomes an Ahab. Very high realization in that life, but not without having to experience the results of karma. Uh, the Buddha could not save him from uh, being, for example, beaten and stoned, not to death, but badly stoned by people whose relatives he had killed, you know, or wounded at least. So Buddha couldn't stop him from that. He had to go through that. But he had the great good fortune of receiving teachings and going beyond sorrow himself. It doesn't say, I don't think, whether he later adopted the Bodhisattva path or not, but he eradicated his own suffering through, you know, the threefold, the higher trainings of uh, ethical conduct, concentration, and wisdom. Shil, Samadhi, Pragya. So, you know, Buddha could have tried to offer him something you know, okay, you know, take my robes, take, you know, whatever, I'll give you this, that, and the other, but don't kill me. <laughs> Any kind of ordinary giving would not have worked. You know, the Buddha knew exactly what Angulimal needed. But it's not just knowing exactly what he needed, but the Buddha had absolutely no fear. And if you have ever come across an animal, a dog, let's say, which appears to be snarling at you, 
And so, but if you have really absolutely no fear of the animal, because whatever, you're used to dogs, so you know them, whatever, you have no fear, then usually nothing, nothing untoward happens to you. The dog also relaxes, may even become friendly. Anyway, the Buddha had a very extraordinary level of unconditional kindness. You could say he radiated love, uh, but without a radiator, no radiator, just radiation of love. It sounds strange, but at least from his side, he didn't feel that he was a radiator of love. There was just radiation of love, kindness. Angulimal felt for the first time in his life, somebody loved him, cared for him, wanted him to be happy. So isn't that something amazing? If one could uh, have that kind of attitude and offer that to others. And sometimes one, did, one wouldn't need to offer them anything material. Just have that extraordinary openness and love, warmth towards uh, another person, person, animal. And others pick it up. One of the most moving things I ever heard was uh, Venerable uh, Robina Curtin talking about her experiences with uh, prison inmates in the United States. And often prison inmates on death row, death row, they could be called up and their appeal rejected and they could be executed, some of them were. But her experiences with such people showed that the power of dharma is something extraordinary, extraordinary. It helps some of those people so much, so much from being very hard-boiled, tough people who, again, had not really received much kindness or love in their life and transform them into people who were not only at peace in a way with their possible executions, but who experienced you know, some of the realizations of the dharma, fearlessness, love, forgiveness, an understanding of what they are, of what they really are as a human being, not just a criminal, or someone rejected by society, sometimes, of course, wrongly in prison, which must be awful, yeah, to think you're in prison, you didn't do that thing, you're in prison. It's not just you're in prison for your years, but you, they're going to execute you for something you didn't do. Imagine what that does to a person's mind. It's hard enough for us to be accused of uh, doing something we didn't do, you know, without having to go to jail, of course. But think of someone who's in jail and could be executed. Even those people help so much by the Holy Dharma, so much, but also due to the kindness of the nuns, mainly nuns, who uh, were visiting these inmates, including uh, uh, Venerable Rabina, who's an incredible character and very courageous and wise teacher, as many of you know, very dynamic. Mm. So, I mean, what, what else can one say about that? Unbelievable gift to those people. Then there's the amazing story of the uh, Mexican, the Mexican criminal, gang leader or gangster, gangster, part of a gang who had killed people. He was in jail. He met one of the nuns from that prison program, liberation program. Uh, he really took to the teachings. He began to study. He began to do mantras and prostrations in prison. And because he was considered so dangerous, you see, they put him in solitary confinement, which for most people is like a torture. Or for many people, it's unbearable to be in solitary confinement. 
to try it for a while. If you're a talkative person, especially, try not talking to anyone and staying in your room for a day, you know, without using your technology to contact people. And then you'll realize what it's like uh, to uh, be confined. And of course, pretend that you're not allowed out of the house. Oh, what would it be like for most of us with Gaga? Anyway, this guy, this Mexican gangster, he began to really take to the Dharma. He was able to practice and study very hard. And Lama Zopar Rinpoche heard about this, my teacher uh, here behind me on my uh, pointing with my symbol. No, that's Lama Zopar Rinpoche. He was a bit younger with a Buddha statue in his hand, in yellow cloth. Um, he heard about this gangster and he wrote him a letter, a marvelous letter he wrote to this gangster saying, look, I'm so happy to hear about what you're doing. So happy. People outside prison think that they are free. You know, they think they're, we think we're free outside prison. But of course, we're caught up in the eight worldly dharmas. We're caught up with anger, attachment, fear, worry, anxiety, all of that garbage. We are, we're in that prison, you know. We're in a prison. You, he said, talking to the gangster, you, however, have turned, transformed your so-called prison into a meditation place. You've turned it into a pure land through your practice, your sincere practice of the teachings. You have food, you have safety, you have solitude. You have everything you need to practice the Dharma. Even yogis outside don't have that because they don't have protection necessarily from wild, wild animals. They have to arrange for their food and have someone come up and, you know, they have to organize all that. You don't have to do that. Everything is provided for you in jail, including security and solitude. And you're able to practice. He says, you are the one who is uh, you know, creating the causes for liberation. You have made your place into a liberation place. You know? Isn't that amazing? It's true. We think we're free. You know, I can go to the main temple. I can go here. I can go there. I can get back to Delhi, hopefully on the 16th. So I'm free. What free? No one is totally free. Not only am I constrained by, you know, things like trains and taxis and other people, but I'm constrained mainly by my own mind, which is in no way free, you know. No way free. So this person again, transformed by what? By the dharma, by the giving of dharma. These nuns helped him transform his life. Of course, he did the main work. He had the seed, he transformed it into action. The nuns, I guess, would only visit for an hour or so now and again, but he transformed his time studying, practicing and receiving such an inspiring letter from uh, Rinpoche. So the gift of the Dharma is something extraordinary. According to those who know much more than me, they say that even hearing some of the words of the Dharma, seeing, looking at a Buddha statue, even if you look at it with disdain or contempt or anger even, still leaves an imprint on the consciousness, which is positive, because it is the Buddha and because of the prayers and the holiness of the Buddha who has prayed life to life that um, whoever has anything to do with him is benefited and all of that. So just introducing people to the Dharma, you know, having above my head his holiness and uh, Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopran Pache, you could argue that that is highly beneficial just for people to see it. You know, it doesn't have to look at my ugly face. You can look at their faces and be inspired, you know. So, and oh, just by doing that, I've created some positive energy by enabling you all to, to see those three images, you know. So, this is the power of the Dharma. So, the giving of the Dharma is. Uh, Amazing. And if it's given with kindness, with love, without 
wanting any reward, without wanting any thanks, then that becomes something very wonderful. That becomes something great. There's a story I've told before, isn't there? Tibetan teacher whose attendant was very upset. Sometimes attendants get very upset, you know. <laughs> hey, this one was upset because the students were not, uh, he felt, paying enough respect and thanking his teacher enough. And the teacher was selflessly teaching, you know, all the time. And the students were not, he felt, grateful enough. And he was complaining to the teacher, these students of yours, you know, what are they doing for you? Nothing. And the teacher said, look, when I am teaching, when I observe all these people, what do I see? I just see suffering beings. I see suffering sentient beings. I just want to help them be free from their suffering. That's it. That's my job, to free them from suffering. I don't need thanks. I don't want thanks. What do I need thanks for? Them? I see suffering beings. I want to help them. So that's the kind of selfless attitude uh, that uh, if one can give with that attitude, that is amazing. Because remember how much already in our lives, how much heartache we've received <clears throat> by wanting, <laughs> wanting people to thank us, yeah? even for small things like passing the salt. And we don't get thanked, we get upset. We think, oh, how rude this person is. You know, conversation ensues in our mind. How wonderful not to need thanks because one is just there to be of service to suffering people. That's amazing. It's possible. So if we can repay the kindness of others in that way, wow, that's something. That's amazing. That's the best way to repay others. Because it's not only helping them, it's helping us become more and more able to help them in the future. For us to be more and more genuinely selfless without harming ourselves. This is not harming ourselves. This is not being uh, self-sacrificing in a negative way. It's something joyful. It's joyful when we don't need to be thanked. So when we need to be thanked, it's a state of anxiety, right? And upset. If we don't need to be thanked, because we're so happy with giving. And, you know, wonderful. So if we can give like that, that would be a wonderful thing. Of course, material objects, of course, if we can give, that's great. Some people need just that right now. They don't, can't hear the Dharma if they're hungry. How can they hear Dharma if they're hungry? Thirsty, afraid, upset. So the people who are working to help others in war zones, or in dangerous situations, they are doing, they're amazing, those people who are helping others on the front lines, you know, helping people uh, in areas which are being bombed still and where there's danger of death if you go somewhere to help someone. But people are doing that right now in the world, in Ukraine and other places, people are doing that. People are taking risks to benefit others, to some very brave journalists may be taking photos so the world can know what is happening in different places. Many journalists die in war and also being executed by governments who don't like what they're doing. There are a lot of brave people around who are trying to help others. It's not just someone with a label Buddhist. So we can help others in many, many ways. And if for some reason we can't go out and do anything, then just to pray and have the aspiration is something very powerful initially. Because without the aspiration, we're not going to do anything. It's better to stay at home and really generate some genuine sense of benefiting others than go out and start helping and be upset because they haven't thanked you or, you know, whatever. Or seem to be ungrateful. But there's a lot of ingratitude around. There's a lot of ingratitude around. I felt it for a moment this morning and then banished it because the little boy who was asking for my uh, 
three quarter full bottle of fruity maza maza mango drink. When I looked at his face and poked him in the stomach playfully, then of course there's no way you can't give to somebody like that, that young, who is obviously, you know, <laughs> he's not from a, a, a well-off family. The only thing one sometimes think is that people get so used to sticking their hands out and begging that that might be not a good imprint. But anyway, in the end, of course, it's no big deal to hand him a bottle. And, I didn't need thanks. Anyway, he smiled, so that was a kind of a thanks. But even if he hadn't smiled, it's okay, right? Mm. So yeah, there's many ways to give. And there are many people who are there I'm always helping with advice and, uh, you know, a place to be, a place to chat, a place to have a cup of tea, whatever. There are many people like this. So that's giving time is something amazing nowadays. If you can give some of your, your so-called, your so-called time. <laughs> Once we were inviting, by the way, Situ Rinpoche is going to teach, and this is amazing news, is teaching at Tushita on the 26th of this month. That is amazing news. He's one of the greatest lamas living, uh, regarded as emanation of Maitreya Buddha. Anyway, uh, he, we once went to visit him. I have some friends who have a house stay in a place near Dhamsala on a tea estate, and they have you know, two of their English guests are staying. And we went to see, we went to his monastery and just asked if he was around and if we could see him. And by chance, this was 10 years ago, we went in to see Situ Rinpoche, just the four of us, or, or five of us, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, we had half an hour with him at least. And then we said, well, you know, thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> He's kind of laughing. It's not my time. It's not my time. Time doesn't belong to anyone. But yeah, if we can offer our presence to people and not keep on thinking it's my time they're taking, don't you think that's something wonderful? One can offer others in this age of, you know, sorry, I have to dash off in a minute. I have a, a call coming. I have blah, blah, blah. It's wonderful to be able to uh, just be there for others, especially when they need you. They need you to listen to them or they're having a hard time because many people and children also nowadays they're not listened to people, parents don't have time or you know meaning parents are too distracted and busy often with their smartphones like everyone else i mean who has time to listen to somebody else you tell me be honest how much time do you spend with other people and not be thinking about the messages on your mobile or what you have to do next. How much have you 100% have, sorry, how much have we been there 100% for another person for more than a few seconds? You know? Really. So we can check these things. And if we can give some genuine presence to others, that's amazing gift. That's amazing repayment of kindness. People are starving for that proper attention, don't you think? Anyway, I've spoken far too long. I'm very sorry. We'll go on because we started late. It's uh, 12.30. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ah, delicious cold tea, I have to say. If tea is well made, then even when it's cold, it's good. <laughs> Kindness of others. I didn't make it. Kindness of others. All the time. Kindness of others. Amazing. Yeah. The well, kindness of others. Don't expect thanks. That's another great motto to live by. Don't expect thanks. It'll just make us uh, unhappy. 
because many people are so caught up with their own problems, their own bubble of anxiety, they don't even notice you have done something for them. So don't worry about it. Just do what we have to do. People are preoccupied. Of course, we can often explain to people, especially people we're responsible for or our children, that they might be more aware and think, you know, I'm not saying we don't ever correct people, but we shouldn't make ourselves upset when people don't thank us. Yeah. And then, of course, the other slogan <clears throat> that his holiness says is uh, dependent arising. Uh, and, you know, see phenomena like a dream. It's like a dream experience. You know, how real is, you know, yesterday for you now, 10 years ago? Or just a few seconds ago, how real is that now? Like a kind of dream. So that helps us be a bit more probably flexible, not hold on to things, good things or bad things, in between things, don't hold on to anything. <clears throat> Sorry, blah, 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 blah. I think I was uh, a lecturer in a past life, I'm sorry. So now we can... Uh, I'm allowing you all to unmute yourselves so that we can have a discussion. Because I've only got Rajesh Ji here, and uh, I'll give priority to all of you kind people, 15 people online. So go ahead you can use the uh reaction put a hand up or you can whatever Anything? repaying the kindness is the theme of course you may not agree that others have been kind in which case you have to work on that one you may think people are very unkind and you may have good reason for that but you may not have looked at the other side of things who knows again i'm talking I'll just shut up and give you space to say what you want. What book on? Bandi nahi hota. Sagar bhai, you are looking very nice with the green behind you. I must say, greenery. By the way, you know, contact. Uh, Vivekji and uh, Nilashi, and uh, do go and enjoy at uh, FA Bata Gyara. Anji, Anji, I'm Pakka Karnevalu. There's something in the chat I hadn't noticed. Hold on. We can't hear you, Kabirji. Okay, that was a long time ago. Now you can hear me. Anything, Bhavya? Or Abashi, Tia? Hi, um, Kabirji. Thank you so much for your teaching. It's not a teaching, but just a blah blah. Yeah. Yes, for your blah blah. Um, Thank you. It's always so um, repeatedly very uh, softening. Uh, to hear these very simple and direct teachings because really mm -hmm. it is for me personally I'm I can be so um, often um, not available not so giving uh, because I'm so consumed in my own well self-protection from whatever uh, imaginable things patterns uh, which one is working with but it's just um, just listening to your words is is so nice to just remind myself to just uh, constantly, constantly coming back to this opening, just constantly seeing that um, there is a always a giving, there's always a receiving. You know, not um, when you look, you are looked back at. You know, and uh, that's uh, this is such a wonderful reminder always just in the smallest things 
you know, small, smallest things. If it's, it is so large, it is actually so large. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. My pleasure. Uh, both guys are always very inspiring for me. And uh, that's some of the benefits of pilgrimage also, being in a place like this. The Buddha himself said that those who go to the, especially where I was born, where I was uh, enlightened, um, where I gave the first teaching and where I will pass away, people who go to these places and the other lesser pilgrimage places with a good mind, it will be very beneficial for them. So uh, I always feel benefited by Bodh Gaya, even if I partly I'm here for work purposes, as I usually am. But um, it's like a pilgrimage also. So one feels inspired by these places. And to have a good bracing walk in the morning and to experience the amazing air and wind a couple of thousand feet up or however high up we were on that mountain, it was very, uh, yeah helps clear the mind of a lot of uh, debris that may have been accumulated in the plains in, uh, in holy Delhi. <laughs> and I'm very grateful to be in Delhi because actually Delhi is extremely beautiful where I am, extremely beautiful right now. From my perspective, not for everyone's, but um, this, is, this beats Delhi here. You know. in its own way. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, interesting uh, antics going on upstairs at Tushita with Bob with his, uh, with his Bollywood glasses and the other where, I don't know, Vivekji has disappeared from the middle. Anybody else have, please share. We have plenty of time. Lunch is being kept for us, no problem. Maybe your lunchtime though, I'm sorry. 12.37. What happened to Vivek? He disappeared. No, he's he taking he he's resting. He is resting. The star anymore. Achha, electricity is getting repaired. The electricity had gone away. Electric the fuse had gone. Yeah. Fuse. Fuse. So now the electrician has come after Capo one hour. Uh, okay. She's getting it repaired. Uh, Nitya is getting it repaired. Kabhi, kabhi, since you're gone, there's no light. <laughs> and there's one guest of yours. Your friend has come from England. Lady. She has been remembering you. <laughs> I, I can't see anything. Uh, you can see her now. Now you can see her. <laughs> now you can see her. Oh, hi. Oh, hi, yeah. Rodin. <laughs> Namaskar. Namaskar. Um, I'm I sitting in a place you. where you have worked before. Yeah, okay. Office. So the winner is very familiar with the office here, having worked here uh, at the beginning of the millennium. Yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you for the. Time. You're looking oh. well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. She, she had a bit of stomach upset. She oh, yeah. ate something. Yeah. But now she's all right. All my personal details. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> it's just some sorrow, Kabirji. It's just some sorrow. <laughs> Yeah, Rowena has a way of burning up her negative karma when she comes to India. This is very good. True. Yeah. yeah. So, what else? I'm happy to be here, Kabirji, and I enjoy the teachings that we heard already. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I hope Bob and others will uh, keep you entertained and well fed. And I don't need entertainment, but no, thank she'll you. Rest. She'll rest. <laughs> Bob's she'll... taking care of me. Don't worry. Yes. Please. <laughs> has access to good uh, samosas in the oh. area. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. samosa. Yes. Okay. I hold you to that. Not today. What oh, else? Uh, some people look like they were on the verge of asking or saying something, but then didn't. But yes. what else? I was going to say something about uh, the fact that uh, on the 14th of April. Uh, Who's talking? Who's talking? Neil. Huh? Neil, Neil. Ah, Neil, okay. Mm. On the 14th of April, can you do something that that honors uh, the birth of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, Baba Sahib? What day of the week is that? It's a, it's a Friday. It's okay. exactly, uh, uh, it's a Friday, yeah. 
Today is Sunday. It's uh, nine. Cloudy here. Actually, that's quite a good idea since um, without Baba Saab and what he did for uh, the so called untouchable people in Maharashtra, uh, millions of people would not have embraced the Dharma, actually. Uh, yeah. So we could, uh, that's actually quite a good idea. We could have a special session on Friday since it's it's not a usual teaching day, but uh, I would be quite interested. I could share some quotations from him. Since yeah. I feel quite close to Baba Sab, you see, he, he adopted Buddhism in 1956, yeah, formally? Yes. It? That's the yes. year I was born. That's the year I was born. So I have some kind of, I feel, I always feel some kind of connection with him and then due to the kindness of some of my Dharma friends I met a lot of followers of Baba Saab in Nagpur, Pune and also other parts of Maharashtra and wow. I was very, very grateful for that because yeah. uh, otherwise I'd been cut off from that. I had only heard a little bit about uh, Baba Saab Ambedkar but to meet uh, people who had uh, whose parents you see had uh, and uh, yeah, that's, refuge that's, with that's, 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 that's my really parents. Yeah, it really transformed their lives, that's for sure. And yes. their sense of uh, confidence in themselves. Although, of course, many issues remain. But uh, yeah, so that's a good idea, Neil. Let's, uh, I'll get uh, Nitya and others to work on that. We'll have a session on uh, Baba Saab B.R. Ambedkar who's a very important figure, and of course, not much spoken about nowadays. I mean, token, uh, token mentions of him, yeah. but for People political he's done, a very great thing. he's done a very great thing, actually. Yes. Um, and his book, The Buddha and His Dhamma, uh, was referred to by no less than Samdong Rinpoche ji as a book that uh, when he gave a talk at um, Nagalok in Nagpur many years ago, he said to the people there, you should all read this book. You know, why haven't you read his book? You know, what mm -hmm. Baba Sahib wants you to do and think that's in this book. You know? But of course, yeah. people have become very politicized and uh, don't actually read much. So they don't know what Baba Sahib actually wrote, but they listen to, I don't know, leaders. Anyway, I we will look at what Baba Saab actually said, and we can have some discussion. Yes. I do, okay? Yes, I do. one. Um, I, anyway, I'll check my diary as soon as I get back to my room to make sure I'm not double booking, but I don't think I've arranged anything for Friday evening. What's today? Today is uh, Sunday, yeah. Okay. Friday is 14th, you're saying? Yes. So, uh, yeah, I'm not leaving for Delhi till the next day. Uh, that's fine. Um, let's do something on Baba Saab Ambedkar. It'll be very useful for people to get a glimpse into why millions of people in Maharashtra and other places have embraced Buddhism. Yes. Um, and we can look at it. Uh, I don't know that much and I haven't been totally up to date in the sense I haven't had discussions with many people uh, lately, but I have enough knowledge and some good books here probably although most of my books on Baba Saab are in Delhi, but we have some in the library here, maybe. So there's a lot online, isn't there? Okay, thanks, uh, Neil, we'll do something. Bhavya, you raised your hand. Yeah. Thank you for the teaching, Kabirji. Um, uh, I, I have a sort of a question on applying uh, kindness to like everyday situations. So we have relationships where like our family or friends where it's easy to sort of be present and be kind back because we realize explicitly how loved we are. But then there are these relationships and changing dynamics. Let's say there's a meeting for business, right? Or, uh, or, or, or online dating, which is such a pain. And we meet someone new and we have to be present, but at the same time, we have to be for me, I, I feel a little protective of myself that I'm likely to get cheated or like this, in the case of dating, this person is looking for something which is not, you know, aligned with my values. So there is also this layer of uh, not being present in the sense wholly. 
um, how do we sort of engage in these conversations and dealings with strangers who we are kind of, uh, you know, defensive about because we've had our own traumas and experiences of being cheated and being desired just for like the sexual gratification. All of these things are there in the background of our mm. minds. So how do we engage with people uh, kindly while also being kind to ourselves? This is a minefield. This is a minefield. Um, <laughs> this is a very difficult question especially to uh, somebody who was a monk for 18 years. I mean, it's also what you're saying is a product of one of the dangers of the, of the modern technical, you know, technological era where you may be engaging with somebody online. So you have no idea, really. You don't have much idea about that person. Um, of course, usually I guess online people are showing their faces if it's something, you know, like dating, but um, how can one, how can one know, even when you meet someone in person, as you say, if one is feeling self-protective, then how do you work with that situation? I suppose the received wisdom Buddhism is, isn't it, that if, if we have worked enough with our own mind, if we feel confident and loving enough in ourselves, then, and if we are also alert and skillful, then we're less likely to go wrong. But how many of us do have good self-confidence, trust in ourselves, a sense of openness? Um, how many of us are, have trained our minds to regard other beings, including ourselves, as basically sick? and therefore likely to be working from not only a place of goodness, but often from a place of confusion and disturbed emotions, you know? If we don't see how others are in that space, then, then we don't have any compassion for them, right? We just feel annoyed and upset and afraid of them. So the more compassion we feel for others, the more strength and courage and kindness we have, built up within ourselves, then the easier things will be. But often we don't wait that long, do we? We want to he plunge headlong into relationships. And then both parties probably quite immature and carrying their own burdens, their own traumas from the past. So yeah, that's that's going to be very difficult, right? That's, that's why I say it's a minefield. It's a minefield where one often, you know, doesn't get killed, but one loses an arm or a leg kind of thing. Um, it all comes down, I think, to how much one feels good about oneself and trusts oneself. Not good in a sense of arrogance, of course not. You know, me, 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 not like that, but just feels calm and composed and good within oneself. And I don't see how that can happen without a lot of inner work, a lot of practice doesn't come naturally to most. And then the more composed you are, the more, I think we really do attract into our lives the kind of people we are, that we are ready for at that time. So if we are basically confused and upset and full of trauma, that's the kind of situation we get into. That's the kind of person or people we get involved with. Which is not bad, but it just makes it harder, right? But if one has worked more on oneself, then there's more chance that we attract something, uh, you know, different kind of vibration. You know? Birds of a feather flock together, that kind of thing. So it always comes down to working on oneself first, developing some wisdom, some kindness, compassion, and some also being worldly wise, but in a nice way, not in a conniving, clever, cunning way. But we have to be alert, obviously. There's plenty of strange, fraudulent things happening. Everyone has Buddha nature, okay, but some people are not manifesting it, right? So they're engaging in a lot of chicanery and plenty of con, con people around, right? 
So of course you have to be alert. The other way also, which would have a lot of uh, supporters in, in the Buddhist camp, especially Mahayana camp, might be that just we need to do a lot of prayers, a lot of prayers that uh, we receive the proper conditions in this life to have temporal happiness, relationship happiness as, as a path towards finding deeper, long lasting you know, dharma happiness. Because yeah, many of us, how many of us can say, oh, we don't need relationships. We don't need this or that. We can just rely on pure dharma. You know, That's not easy. <clears throat> so we do need to relate. So then we, at least we can relate um, wisely, right? Without fear. And fear is a big, that's the number one problem, isn't it? Self-grasping ignorance promotes primarily a sense of fear, which you mentioned, a need to protect me. But if you feel basically confident about yourself, then there's less fear. So when, when you're afraid, you go in the street, dogs will be more likely to attack you if you're afraid. If you're not afraid, they just leave you alone. It's like that. Of course, I'm not comparing human beings to dogs, but you know, it's a bit like that. If we're okay, others are kind of, we draw out, we attract the okayness in other people. If we're not okay at all, somehow that is, it's like a tuning fork. It's like things uh, vibrate in resonance. We pick up other very damaged people if we ourselves feel very damaged. Right? Does that make sense? Yes and no. Um in that we do work on ourselves, but it's a spectrum. It's it's like so if we started working on ourselves more consciously, say about uh, two years ago, then we're still not a hundred percent there, but we're better than where we used to be. So, mm. Yeah. Uh, but also like things for me to reflect on. Uh, yeah. So I, I think someone else had a hand up. So just you okay. them and now. if we're in a hurry, then we're in trouble. Because we always seem to be in a hurry, us modern people. But um, that seems to be a problem, you know. Myself, Ajirji, some maybe some other people here have the benefits of being born in the middle of the last century, which is a long time ago for some of you. But I think we were used to things being slower. We didn't expect instant replies to things, you know. You, you wrote a letter, you didn't expect a reply in 10 seconds, right? 10 days, maybe. Now we're in a hurry. But uh, it seems that some things need to take time to gestate, right? Mm -hmm. Divya, Divya Ji. Thanks, uh, Divya. Very good. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Kavir Ji. Yeah. Ah, Divya Ji. Oh, this is another Divya. I thought, oh, am I confused? Well, that Divya's daughter, maybe? No, anyway, no, that's... Another Divya. Okay. Yes, yes. Bolia. So, uh, for me, it's a question in uh, relation to what Bhavya she had just asked. Mm. So, uh, to be honest, uh, going through something similar in life uh, right now, that right, what she had asked about uh, infidelity in relationships these days and how people are so easy to cheat on. And of course, I believe that what you said, uh, that you attract similar kind of energies in your life. And uh, I, I believe that uh, since I have been through this very recently, that someone did try to make sexual advice of me. But uh, once I, like, since I'm a healer myself and I heal people who go through such situations, uh, I was very well told that uh, you are attracting this because you are being with such energies, because you are healing such people. So you are only to this, and this is energy is manifesting in life. But I believe what I have been through with this situation is because some, some trauma that person might have had in his life that he wants to sexually gratify him through, you know, giving pain to uh, in someone else's life, but. I just had this question in mind that 
if someone gives you pain and gratifies himself so i don't know like i went back to my moral science lessons in school that aap diya matlab diya ko chahe kitna bhi pain diya jaye wo deta to roshni hi hai i don't know if this is the right way to approach this situation or such people who want to gratify themselves but they give you pain which is a trauma actually uh, is this a right way to approach this that if my even if my body can gratify you in some way yeah. i have been it's trauma to me but it's a pleasure for you so how to approach this situation one needs a whole session on this and also someone who is more specialized in this kind of huh. trauma yeah. which i can't pretend to be but um again i think and i come across this all the time with myself that i'm supposed to be some kind of uh, somebody who uh, talks about dharma you know some people even call me guruji many people this is very embarrassing because one realizes one's own lack you know one's own um, lack of uh, realization lack of awareness so you can call yourself we can call ourselves what we want you know teacher healer but uh, to be a genuine teacher healer this is something very deep very amazing right very uh, not easy let's say so one self has a lot to heal within oneself one has um, you know that inner life we were talking about were you here at the beginning of the session today oh, okay we were talking about uh, the importance of the inner life which mostly we neglect because we are dealing with externals right one way or another so if we really come to terms with who we are inwardly and working with that and using the in this case the buddhist teachings to understand who we are and how to transform some of the difficult bits and transform again is a very easily used word but you know transform is a big word who can transform you know it's not like transforming warm milk and starter into dahi you know that just takes eight hours and it's seems to work every time but transforming the mind that's something else right um it requires a lot of inner work so one overall thing that helps always which my teacher talks about he says that when problems come experience them with compassion so of course that's a very wide right? how does one actually apply that one has to again realize that what somebody did may be told that could be wrong could be very wrong but you have to realize that why would a person do that to you you know because we would say because they are suffering because they are having problems they have uh, delusions they have uh, disturbing emotions so they are behaving in a way that is harming us yeah but actually they are harming themselves even more in one sense because they are creating a habitual pattern which they're going to repeat again and again and so it's going to create negative karma which they will have to experience the results of which will be suffering results so of course if one had the ability or the skill or the power one could um, and that one has to know oneself given the context one has to uh, one could try and correct that person or talk to that person or even scold that if it was appropriate but if that doesn't if it's obvious that's not going to work then you just have to deal with it inwardly and what's hard it seems the hard for some people is to let go of abusive relationships that somehow you know you get abused in a relationship but it's it seems impossible for many people for whatever reason to leave that relationship it must be even harder if you have children you know, together with that person whether married or not um but if it's someone and i mean if there's no children involved there could be other things in the property this that it becomes horrendously complicated doesn't it so as i said this needs a whole session to itself but um if you are a real bodhisattva then as my teacher lama zoprimpache says if we are really acting in a bodhisattva fashion which is very difficult he would say uh your job is to think oh, how wonderful if i'm used by others used by others and he actually you know he said this because people come to him right people who work in centers and say i feel used by this person 
you know how we use that in modern english i'm used matlab someone's exploited me by taking advantage of me not sexually in this case but just by getting to me to do more work or this or that or whatever and then rimbache responded you know as bodhisattvas uh, 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 do you know that word bodhisattva have you heard that word okay bodhisattva in the mahayana buddhist tradition is somebody who genuinely aspires to attain the state of buddhahood in order to benefit others in order to help them also become buddhas this is based on the understanding that we all can become a buddha because we all have the buddha nature so the bodhisattva is someone who totally cherishes and cares for others having given up uh, cherishing or taking care of only of oneself and is able to work selflessly for others selflessly uh, without it being a great big deal sacrifice kind of thing but because they've given up that notion of me 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 they're able to work for others without that you know need for thanks blah 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 all that so bodhisattva my teacher said prays to be used by others of course it doesn't mean we pray to be used by others sexually because that's something very very difficult right traumatic that's something even dangerous right so but the point is if one has already been taken advantage of how are we going to deal with that are we going to keep a chip on our shoulder all our life if it's a man who's abused us are we always going to hate men at some level will that help so again it comes down to the inner work doesn't it I've got to work on myself although it's painful and again if one is a buddhist nothing happens without a cause so if i'm hurt by somebody it's not as though it just a bolt out of the blue and it's got nothing to do with this thing i call me it has got something to do with you the fact that you were abused so again the whole notion of cause and effect that one can begin to study and work with which helps us to understand why we're experiencing what we do it's not just feel like it's you know god did it or it's just totally random it should be very unfair also but buddhism says no there is a cause for things why some people are have a very easy you know going and happy relationships why some people are cheated and abused there's causes for these things which of course go back to the birth of this life so there are different ways of working with it but i think the main thing we have to do is make peace with ourselves isn't it and if as i said if it's appropriate to scold or to be able to correct somebody else then we should do so but often we can't so we have to let it go but then we hopefully are learn from our lesson and don't allow that to keep on happening if it happens again and again we realize it's something we have to work on within ourselves there's a karmic pattern playing out which has a cause and so basically we have to do a lot of purification and so uh to purify the causes that are creating the suffering which of course is uh, not popular because people want usually easy methods um don't accept karma actually don't accept those kind of teachings because they're not easy and so people don't accept that we need to purify mentally they accept you know people want to quick results i'm not saying you do but some people do so the whole thing about buddhist purification and it taking time uh has to be taken on board i think if one wants to deal with these things effectively otherwise they just keep on happening i would think we can go back to this again another session but i think for now that's all i'd want to say this can get very very tricky. yeah thank you thank you so much but um we are not condoning negative behavior from others especially sexual abuse but um what we're saying is that we have to always we have to do the work on ourselves simply because we can't force another person to behave in a different way right i cannot control how another person behaves ultimately but i can control my own mind and my own body properly as much as i can that's what's going to save us buddha didn't become buddha by controlling a whole lot of other people getting them to behave in a certain way right buddha became a buddha by transforming his own mind let's let's remember that it comes from the work we do on ourselves always so 
your redemption or whatever you want to call it will come through and mine will come through the work we do on ourselves ultimately others can help of course and painful experiences could help if we can deal with them skillfully but it's not easy what do you think does that make any sense i'm sorry if we've gone on yes yes totally totally uh, it makes sense to me but uh, just that uh, it feels like uh, like to me only like if you want if we can heal that person that would be like even if they have wronged us it's like i always that i'm obliged to heal that person sorry so I that's didn't, your your voice is not clear and i don't have good hearing can you repeat that slowly <coughs> yeah am i audible now yeah yeah you're audible it's just my hearing is that uh, even if uh, someone has done wrong to me in my life in any which way i just feel that i am obliged to heal that person i have never you know got in a sense of being guilty because i know myself i, I know i am not wrong it's just their imprint they are showing to me yes. but yeah uh, it's just i feel obliged to heal them that's it yeah yeah i think one should when necessary let go and say yeah look this is not helping either of us so what's the point and even if you know people have children together sometimes it's much better for the children in some cases that they do separate of course then it depends on what kind of arrangement they have and the kids may be attached to both parents you know it can be horrendous but um if there's no children involved in that responsibility for the children then often it's better you know why be in a situation where you're just creating harm for each other every day you know through bickering and bad thoughts and some bad actions what's the point you know better to stop it but i'm not saying it's easy <laughs> there's karmic bonds or karmic bonds sometimes one cannot let go of the person who is harming one this is the power of uh, karma and habitual patterns but yeah one has to let go sometimes isn't it it's just too horrendous otherwise thank you thank you uh thank you divya okay. Mm-hmm. hope this helps okay it's uh must be close ah oh, it's gone one o'clock okay so maybe just uh, a few more minutes <clears throat> anybody mm-hmm. no okay good we'll dedicate very important to start the session motivation then the the sec- that said to be three excellences three excellences three excellent things first is the excellent motivation which we attempted then excellent uh, main session main part where one engages sincerely in the practice or whatever one is doing so in this case we had some blah blah and some discussion so we did that and i hope uh, i tried to be sincere from my side and you were all sincere and, you know with integrity uh not to any pretense if possible so we did the second part the, the second excellence third excellence is to dedicate which means that we recognize we've done something useful we dedicate the energy for some positive outcome so the positive outcome you see here has to be ultimately to create the causes and conditions for our total enlightenment so that we become fully awakened people who can then offer unbelievable benefit to others uh, which cannot you know we couldn't imagine in thought or word the kind of benefit buddhas could uh, can um, deliver for others it's inconceivable because it is often most of it is unseen um so may we become like a buddha meantime may we generate more and more uh, fearlessness through uh, proper understanding of who we are that there is no independent solid permanent i me or mine may we really begin to understand those teachings on selflessness and the teachings on compassion uh, seeing clearly one's own and other's suffering and wishing aspiring to free oneself and others from suffering together with loving kindness wishing others to be happy may we develop those qualities may we never be separated from the teachings that help us develop these qualities 
may we never be separated in this and future lives from authentic, kind teachers who can guide us on the way. May the kind teachers we have in this life have long and healthy lives. May their wishes for us be fulfilled. We should pray like this. May always those who wish to practice Dharma, may they always find the causes and conditions to be able to practice. This is very important. May they never feel that they are alone and don't have the helpers or the facilities to practice. May that always be there. May beings think of benefiting one another. May the awful conflict and wars happening in the world, may they come to an end. May people realize that uh, everyone wants happiness, doesn't want to suffer, and therefore may people think of cooperating and at least living in some kind of uh, uh, peace, peaceful coexistence, even if they don't help each other, they not harm each other. We can pray in these ways that through our meeting today, may this positive energy blossom, benefit in this way for these things to happen. And especially we dedicate for the long life, which is Holiness of Dalai Lama, Kabji Lama Zupinpache, all the great teachers who are benefiting others, may they have long and healthy lives. And please make a note in your diary of 26th evening at Toshita, the great His Eminence Tai Situ Rinpoche. Uh, not sure of the topic yet, but whatever he talks about is uh, beneficial. I can't remember the topic. It will be posted very soon. So uh, thank you all very, very much, online people, and uh, Rajeshji here at uh, Root Institute. Uh, please take care. And uh, then also, yeah, we'll have that session on Friday on Baba Sadam Bedkar, as well as our regular Monday, uh, Tuesday, and Thursday program next week uh, from, uh, from here, from uh, Root Institute. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everybody, uh, from both Gaya. And take care. Uh, see you all soon. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Kabir. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> See, uh, COVID came to 2020 March.